Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, CGD Talks. Um, we're very, very pleased actually to be having this event today. It's about supporting African health systems in the time of COVID and beyond, a view from Japan. We're gonna be talking to um, people on the front line of the response to this pandemic and the support that they're getting from a very important partner that is the Jap Jap Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA. So we're very, very happy that you're able to join us today. We just wanted to, uh, um, and uh, over the course of this, of course, we're gonna invite the audience to be able to ask questions. If you have questions for the panelists, uh, please send them to, you can send them by email to events at cg, cgdev.org. Uh, that's cgdev.org. You can tweet at cgdev and it's um, hashtag cgdtalks or you can submit your comments via uh, um, YouTube and we'll, and we'll answer them. I think um, currently Africa, in terms of the numbers we're seeing, Africa still has supposedly the lowest uh, infection numbers, um, but those numbers are growing exponentially. Um, we've seen a 21% increase over a seven day reporting period. Um, as it stands, Southern Africa is responsible for 72% of the cases. I mean, as an example of that, the Western Cape in South Africa has only 0.5% of the population of the continent, but has about 17% of the cases. In North Africa, we have about 10% of the cases, West Africa, 9%, East Africa, 8%, and Central Africa, 2%. Um, over the last, since July 14, five countries in Africa have been responsible for 82% of the increases in uh, rates. The problem is, it's really unclear what these numbers mean um, because there's so little testing that has been done. And so because there's so little testing that has been done, it's hard to draw conclusions from these. Um, and according to the United Nations, uh, only four African countries keep high quality record of deaths. And so because of this, and because of um, new challenges that are gonna come. It is important for us to talk about strengthening African health systems, rebuilding African health systems, not simply for this pandemic, but for to come. And so today I'm excited to be joined by um, uh, Takao Toda. He's uh, the vice president of, of human security and uh, global health at JICA. I think it's important to point out how important JICA is to Africa. Over the last few years, there have been a lot of Af Africa summits, this, but one of the first ones was from Japan in 1993, the Tokyo International Conference on African Development, TCAD. So it's important how Japan, an important partner that Japan has been to, to Africa. Also joining us from East Africa is the Yeri Kumbi, the Director General, Professor Kumbi is the Director General of the Kenya Medical Research Institute. From West Africa, Ghana, we have Ibrahim Kwambina Anang. He's the Director of the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research. And of course, um, her Excellency, the Minister of Water Hygiene and Sanitation, Her Excellency Vuari. She's here, Madam Minister, welcome. And uh, again, like I said, if you have questions, and please uh, use the means that we've set and submit those questions to us. We want to begin today first by just talking about setting up the groundwork and setting what is the initial stage of COVID-19 crisis management in the country and, and what is the current situation? So we'll just start with Professor Anand. Well, what did it look like in Ghana and what is the current situation? The beginning of uh, COVID-19 in Ghana, the first cases we had was in on 12th of March, 2020, sorry, 2020. And then um, when COVID cases started appearing in Ghana, we already had a national coordinating committee at the Ministry of Health, a technical co committee. But in view of the pandemic and the serious nature of COVID around the world, the president of the country of the Republic of Ghana decided to take over that function and bring it to the presidency. So a national COVID-19 task force was established, <coughs> sorry, was established and uh, it was run from the presidency and the president as chairman. And that decision helped a lot because uh, the president was able to mobilize the resources of the nation for the COVID response. At the beginning, all the positive cases were isolated in, in, uh, for treatment or for clinical care. Wow. And also there was um, a lockdown and uh, communities 
that were deprived were provided with the uh, social safety net incentives, food and water and things like that. And then community response at that time was not very effective because there were some communities that were even not very sure about whether COVID is a real threat. So we had some local communities that didn't take it seriously. And then we also had even nationally issues about how to use face masks. There was a question as to whether face masks were really very effective or not and, and things like that. So at the beginning, things were a bit uh, difficult, but the president's initiative, and he started an, a, a, a national you know, uh, assignment, nationwide um, announcements or statements on COVID-19 response and, and, and update and progress. And he has done that since March up to now and has issued 14 different statements. And in these statements, he told the nation where we are, what is happening, what are the measures, how schools were closed, churches were closed, you know, sporting activities were stopped, uh, no, uh, you know, social gatherings, funerals were stopped. And then it was allowed to do about only uh, 20 or so people at a time came to 50. So in the beginning, this was the, the situation. And there was only one institute that could test for COVID at the beginning in Ghana. And this is the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, which was established with a, a grant aid from the government of Japan. And this institute has been a front runner in Ghana and providing front running service in West Africa. Uh, so that was the nature of the beginning. Also, one interesting thing was that when we started testing for COVID in Ghana, it was thought that um, the population started doubting whether the tests were even correct or accurate. Because initially, all the tests from April were negative and negative and negative. Until we got to March 14th, that we got the first case. And then we found that the first cases were all imported cases. And so that was how the beginning was. And now, what we have is that um, we have been able to expand testing sites. We now have 13 cent centers that can test for COVID. Uh, we have um, also found that most of the cases here are asymptomatic and the number of total deaths in Ghana now from COVID is only 175 and uh, the percentage death is 0.5%. So uh, the number of recoveries are large, 31,286. The number of confirmed cases are 35,142. Uh, the, the new cases today are 700, uh, not today, I mean in the, the, this week or so, 736. And then um, the, the active cases that are in isolation centers are 3,281. We have also been able to nationally, there was a massive effort to build a new infectious diseases hospital. And this was, the, there was a, a rapid plan to do that in 12 weeks. And actually in 12 weeks, we just inaugurated an infectious disease hospital, the first infectious disease hospital in Ghana, uh, which is a hundred beds capacity. And then also the health system, the Ghana health system is put in place a plan to integrate COVID testing into TB program uh, resources using the gene expert platform to also test for COVID. That is about to start. And then the, the measures for uh, COVID response have been relaxed reasonably. It's been relaxed in the sense that now um, churches are reopened. Uh, we have uh, schools, universities were reopened, but not fully. Final year students were asked to come back to school or go back to school and take the examinations and that was done. And I'm at the University of Ghana and this involved a, uh, uh, we were expecting about 10,000 students to come back to Ghana, I mean, sorry, to the university for exams, but the university had already put in place online platforms for teaching and even for taking examinations. So in the end, only 1,000 students came back to the university for the exams. And the 1,000 students that came back, we found only eight infected uh, students in the period. So the infection rate even has been very low among the students who came. Also high schools are now open 
and 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 the high schools, uh, the the senior high schools, that those in the final year taking their examinations are in school now, and we have some cases too, but there are not many. So this is the kind of situation we have in Ghana now. And then the other major uh, uh, event is that uh, the private sector has joined the COVID response strongly. And we have a lot of donations from the private sector and we have private sector initiatives to expand the capacity for testing. So at the Nguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research of University of Ghana, for example, we have some private sector uh, uh, partners who are joining to expand testing capacity. So this is the nature of uh, COVID response so far in Ghana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nang. Now we turn to Professor Kombi. Uh, what what is what what is it like what uh, what was it like in, in, in Kenya in terms of response? What what does it look like now? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Kenya actually has gone through almost uh, the same experience as uh, has been happening in Ghana. Uh, our first case was registered uh, in the same month of March this year. And uh, from the time that that uh, particular case was uh, registered, was diagnosed in Kenya, uh, the president of this republic, His Excellency, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta actually uh, took it upon himself to start directing and uh, uh, guiding the efforts actually fight this uh, disease. And uh, what he did was to put up uh, uh, committees and uh, response teams, uh, that is a COVID-19 response teams. And uh, these committees are, have been composed of uh, cabinet secretaries, uh, permanent or principal secretaries in, in the country, very, very senior levels indeed. And uh, from, uh, for, from these particular committees, a lot of activities of various activities have been directed and uh, they have been guiding this country in uh, tackling various aspects of, 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 uh, of uh, this particular uh, menace that we have been uh, seeing, uh, COVID-19. Uh, we know that for sure the economy has uh, not been doing well from the time that COVID-19 struck here. Uh, we know that even the education sector has been hit in this particular country in that uh, students actually have not been going to school because all schools have been closed all the way from the nursery to university level. And uh, we have also closed churches within this country. So religious activities have, have ceased for quite some time now uh, to, to take place in this country. But through this particular guidance, uh, uh, our, our ministries also have had also uh, committees that are set up. And uh, if I refer particularly to the Minister of Health, the Minister of Health right from the beginning of uh, this particular outbreak in this country, uh, a number of various uh, committees have been set up. And each of these committees has been dealing with the, uh, an aspect of this particular ad, uh, outbreak. I'm talking about uh, uh, diagnosis. So, for example, the committees that uh, are purely dealing with uh, diagnosis, diagnostics within the country, or talking about uh, health education, contact, uh, contact tracing all over the, 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 the country. And again, uh, when uh, this particular outbreak started in, in this country, we had only two laboratories that could diagnose uh, COVID-19. And this one was based, one was based in Cambry, and the other one at the National Influenza Center within the Ministry of Health. But with time, there's been a lot of expansion of these activities. Uh, we're aware that uh, very, very far away places, like in the north of this country, uh, they could not undertake this diagnosis because they did not have the facility. And uh, with the time, uh, these uh, diagnostic laboratories have expanded. Uh, uh, we have uh, in Cambridge, for example, we have well over six laboratories that diagnose uh, COVID-19. And uh, private laboratories also have been uh, involved in this, uh, including also laboratories within the Ministry of Health and uh, various hospitals across the country. So quite a lot has been going on now and we have expanded our, our diagnostic capacity 
to the extent that uh, a lot actually is going on and the diagnosis can be done in large numbers uh, that, than was the case before. Uh, uh, the, the, the Kimri uh, diagnosis actually has been supported quite a lot by, by partners. And, uh, we actually commend our, uh, our supporters like JICA, the CDC, and uh, other organizations that have been supporting and availing testing kit that has been one of our biggest uh, uh, issue that we have had to grapple with uh, now and then. But uh, as of now, uh, our churches are, uh, remain closed because of the fact that uh, the numbers of uh, COVID-19 in this country have uh, continued to soar. As we speak now, it's, we are well over 19,000 in this country. We have, uh, that is the cases that have been so far recorded. And we have well over 300, uh, people that have died so far. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the efforts that are actually on against COVID-19 supported or uh, directly uh, uh, supported by our president have really borne a lot of fruits. And uh, we, at this time, uh, education is, has been provided everywhere to the public. Public, at least now, in uh, quite a number of places, you'll find them with uh, masks, but of course, uh, the issues are uh, the challenges of getting um, as many as possible of people to put on masks, because that is one of the uh, positions that we would wish to actually get everybody to do, to put on masks in controlling this particular uh, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Kombi. Now we'll turn to Her Excellency. Madam Minister, you're, you're in charge of, of, of the response. You're leading, you're on the front line of leading Madagascar's response to this. Can you talk to us a little bit about the preparedness, the state of um, Madagascar preparedness and what the situation is like currently? Uh, thank you and uh, hi everyone. Uh, very good day to everyone. It's a pleasure for me to, uh, to join you for this webinar to share the experiences of Madagascar. And I want to specially thank JICA uh, especially also for JICA Madagascar office for uh, inviting me to, to join this uh, webinar. So uh, for Madagascar, the case uh, starts in uh, March. And um, let's, let me start with uh, how, how Madagascar is began to handle the crisis management of this, of this pandemic COVID-19. Uh, first, when uh, it starts in February, we, we lock uh, you, uh, we ban all flights from over China and uh, some risky uh, countries. But after that, before uh, we identified the first case of COVID-19 in Madagascar, we did the quarantine uh, all, late, all, uh, uh, all the 2,000 passengers of the, the um, of the flights from all over the country that's uh, of risk. And uh, our strategy is to, was to implement specific regional lockdown first measure and to track all contacts, all contact tracing and uh, treat them in isolation within uh, chosen special facilities. Unfortunately, after uh, uh, four months, um, of health state of emergency in Madagascar, we have 10,000 cases, but and uh, uh, 7,000 uh, 7, cured case, cases, but unfortunately, uh, 100 deaths. Our experts predict that it will, we, we will attain yet the peak state by the mid of, of the end of. August because now we, we enter in the winter, winter, winter uh, phases now. But uh, so we multiply in tremendous efforts of two folds. First, to limit the spread chain in this virus. And second, to limit the, the casualty by improving our capacity to take in charge patients, especially vulnerable cases. But with regarding particular particularly to my mission as the minister of what in charge of water, hygiene and sanitation, we mostly focus 
on our activity in order to prevent and limit the spread of the, of the virus infection by our acti activities. To do so, we cooperate with national level under the coordination of designated structure called the CCO. It is a center of commandment and operation. And in its 20, we have 22 regions and we have a regional also uh, a center of commandment for the strategy. For the leadership, first, our uh, president of Republic, Andy Radzuelina, is in front line also for all activity against COVID-19. By chairing this, uh, this center of, for commandment and operation against COVID-19, and all the ministry in the country are in the strategic uh, uh, commit, uh, committee. And this committee is under the, the Ministry of, um, of Interior and Decentralization and also the Ministry of Health. For my part, for my mission, since the, the start of the health state of emergency in March, my department conducted periodical, periodic disinfection campaign and also a big hand washing campaign all over the country in the 22 region. Also, we provide hand washing facilities because in Madagascar, around 40% 40, 40 of, uh, of the people has only access to to water, so if you have the the some uh, some um, to reduce the the, the to spread uh, for the spreading of the virus, we should uh, make a big campaign for to provide water and also to provide soaps and hand washing facilities. And uh, this month we reduced the, the price of water at what at water public points for uh, a a three big uh, cities like the capital to uh, um, to have the, the water at the at, at the house and some uh, and uh, to to fight against this uh, this covid-19 that is for my my uh, my point in my only in my mission because uh, we have all ministry have this their mission and for me we, today i will just talk about how for water, uh, water, hygiene and sanitation for my part for Madagascar. So thank you for, for this. I think I can, I can add something after for, uh, for this, but the thing is, the thing is that for the, we have also the social parts. Of course. We have the, um, we have uh, the health problem and we also have the social because it's very difficult for the, for the people to be locked down, to be in quarantine. And so they need food and some, the, the country, the government provides some food to the, to the population and take some measure for education, for, uh, uh, to distribute some help, help to, the, to the people that or some grants or some, some kind of, um, of, uh, of help to the people. That's, that is for Madagascar, thank you. Thank you, Madam Minister. Actually, on that point, we'll come back to that in terms of what national leadership is doing outside of this to be able to. But now we want to turn to the partner in question here, uh, the partner who uh, everyone has acknowledged, uh, and that's uh, JICA. So, Dr. Toda, how, how, how has Japan been providing support to its African partners uh, at JICA? Is uh, Dr. Tola there? Okay, okay. Can you hear Great. me? Great. Yes, we can okay. hear you. Now. Okay, 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 okay. But before uh, mentioning our activity on the soil of Africa, let me very, very quickly touch upon uh, sure. the very important thing about the status quo of Africa. Other than a friend, uh, old friend uh, to Africa. Uh, I'm very much proud 
of saying that the African people and the African nations have been very, very much successful for the fight against the first wave of COVID-19. Mm. We have been very carefully observing the situations all over the world for the past month to find that some of African countries are performing much, much better than Japan and other economically rich countries. I have to tell you very frankly. But at the same time, secondly, we have to be very much cautiously prepared for the coming serious and maybe the deepest in the decades crisis Africa's waiting. What is it? The first thing is crisis on health system. As many people said, Africa is the youngest continent who have enough physical and uh, epidemiological uh, resilience against COVID-19. So most of our experts are not so much worrying about the direct impact on COVID-19. Rather, rather, as most of our colleagues mentioned, we have been already observing serious damage on the whole system of health. Mm -hmm. And second crisis is about socioeconomic, cultural, educational crisis. As uh, three of our colleagues mentioned very rightly, Africa will face unprecedented crisis about the socioeconomic, cultural, educational system. Mm -hmm. We have to be very much prepared for. By saying so, uh, JICA is trying to our best on the three dimensions. The first one is, of course, to respond to the emergent needs for Africa. And the second one needs to support and construct, reinforce the resilient and comprehensive health system. And the third one, it might be euphoristic, but we have to aim for building up better concept to construct new normal in the continent of Africa. So we are working on the three phases. And as for the first phases, I have to be very much honest that JICA in terms of quantity uh, may not be dynamic enough. Why? Because more than 90% of our staff members mainly with Japanese nationalities had to be go back to Japan. And uh, that limits a lot of our powers. However, our dear colleagues, we call it national staff members and our colleagues in Noguchi Institute of Kemuri, those people are working very hard, but that had limit. So what we are focusing of course, by continuing our emergency activities, we need to be very much ambitious about our commitment to the second and the third stage, comprehensive health system strengthening. Maybe we will later uh, touch up on this point. Mm -hmm. But after, by saying so, I have to tell you, uh, we are not, how to say, main actor or on the driver's seat about the African fight against COVID-19. Our basic concept is human security and is to be close to the ownership or to be close to the African ownership. That is our very important principle. I'll stop here and let us continue our discussion because the time is running out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tura. Dr. Tura. And now we'll, we'll turn to um, uh, most of you, uh, beginning with that, um, uh, Dr. Um, Anang and then Professor Kombi and, and uh, Her, Her Excellency, the minister spoke about it. We just wanted to, and either of you can respond to this, 
in terms of the national leadership. You talked about how the president <clears throat> in almost each of, in all three of the countries, the president actually took over the response. How has this been helpful to the response? How has it, um, have there been challenges to that in terms of <clears throat> national leadership? And anyone can answer this question. In Ghana, I, I go ahead in Ghana. In Ghana, the taking over of the leadership by the presidency has been extremely positive. Um, it has not been challenged in any way. And the whole nation, including the health systems, the Ministry of Health, the Ghana Health Service, have rallied behind that. And the Ministry of Health has worked with presidential uh, advisors for health and, and delivered on this package. Okay. That, that initiative has helped the country also because the presidency was able to announce relief packages for COVID-19. Uh, incentives like uh, tax relief for frontline workers, health workers was implemented. Also, frontline workers had 50% of their basic salary as bonus for six months, ending in September. And then also uh, that uh, initiative helped to uh, mobilize um, additional resources to position, uh, 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 to provide free testing, free testing to majority of the, of the communities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Madam Minister, um, Professor Combe, you want to talk about the presentation? Okay, please. Madam, Madam Minister goes first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for the national leadership for, uh, for the leadership of Madagascar, mm -hmm. uh, our president, as I said before, our president, uh, Andira Duelina, is in the front line and all activity against COVID. We put the, we implement the, the national committee, it's named the Center of Commandment of Operation, under the one ministry in charge of decentralization and uh, also there is the Ministry of Health. Under this, there is a, a, uh, a coordination with a national um, office for uh, disaster and relief, yeah. which coordinate all operational, but it is a very, um, uh, there is a synergy with all the ministry. All the minister of, uh, there is the multi-sectorial uh, for, for example, for health, for education, and everything for economic, because as you said, it's not only a health crisis, it is also economic crisis, it is, there is also social crisis. So uh, one of good example of, of, strong, of strong leadership by the state could be reflected on the promotion of uh, the COVID organism organics a decoction by based on traditional medicine plants mm -hmm. and over madagascar endemic plants also for to prevent and to first to increase the immun immunity of uh, each people uh, the it is also to be said that the case in african country is the valorization of traditional plants medicines was a big help for uh, for the reinforcement of human immune defense in contrast the respect for social distanciation is hard to implement as like in any african country given mm. the fact of the social cultural and economic structure and the infrastructure we have in place because sometimes if you make a lockdown the one one family, maybe there is ten person inside in a, a, a little in a little room. It's very difficult for them to be in quarantine. Mm -hmm. So we envy the discipline of the Japanese population for in this perspective. And a second example of good leadership is the vulgarization of hand washing campaign in Madagascar. I myself to participate to launch this uh, hand washing campaign under JICA cooperation project and now adopted 
as national program for implemented by all development partner. And uh, it is commonly admitted that WASH program and especially hand washing campaign and provide some facility and uh, water supply is a strategic component for combating virus pandemics such as COVID-19. And that's an example that I want to share today. And uh, as we say that human security is a freedom from want, from want and freedom also from will. So this human security is one leadership that the, our country uh, wants to, to be implement, to implement. And also we already um, have uh, implemented this with the social uh, approach, wash, disinfection, and also, and the important is also to support all, all health workers who are in front line every day with the, with, with, the, with this uh, pandemic. So that is our, uh, uh, an example that we want to share today to you, to all of you. Thank you, Madam Minister. Thank you, uh, Professor Combe. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, just as I said a little earlier, right from the beginning, when uh, we had the first case of COVID-19 in this country, uh, I did indicate that the president himself of this country took leadership and uh, actually appointed a number of committees, with national response uh, uh, teams, as well as committees that have been uh, actually directing uh, the way in which actually we were fighting this disease. Uh, this particular disease uh, has actually affected literally every uh, particular uh, sector. And uh, I think this is the same as any other country. And uh, all these sectors actually have suffered, but it was important for the leadership actually to make sure that the committees or the response teams that are, who are constituted involves, uh, involved as much as possible the ministers in the various uh, ministries in this country. And this in itself has actually played in very well. Uh, a lot of uh, information has been availed, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, issues that would otherwise have been very difficult to resolve have actually been resolved through these committees. Now, some of the things that uh, we know we have been facing in uh, this country, the same as any other country, is the economic beating that uh, actually the, the country has, has faced as a result of this outbreak. Now, the president himself being aware of this and uh, through the committees that uh, have been set uh, has been able to provide tax, tax reliefs as actually our colleagues in, in Ghana have and uh, also uh, using uh, other subcommittees, mobilizing resources, including funding including uh, uh, supplies and other necessary items that are important for the fight against COVID-19, we have been able to actually move on with this particular war. But uh, one thing that I must say here is that uh, as, as we continue to fight and mobilize resources for this particular uh, war, uh, of course there are other many challenges that we face and uh, this country is not uh, uh, any different from the many others. A lot of uh, uh, medical supplies, uh, of course, we have run out of some of these uh, supplies sometimes, but we continue to mobilize resources to be able to actually acquire more for our hospitals. Thank you, Professor Kombe. And I think uh, Dr. Koda, Dr. Koda will come back to you here because you started talking about this. And uh, in, in order for us to be able to respond to this, and other infectious disease outbreaks that will come in the future, we need uh, domestic health systems that are strengthened and that are able, and a big part of that is our ability to do testing. So in terms of JICA support to the strengthening of health systems, can you talk to us a little bit about what specifically JICA is doing? The, um, the minister from Madagascar talked about the water and sanitation and hygiene projects. Could you talk to us about other things that JICA is doing uh, um, in terms of strengthening African health systems? Dr. 
Okay, okay, I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me talk about the resilient health system. The definition of resilience, in my sense, is a self-control, self-regulation, ownership, power of discovering the solutions and make it on the ground. And JICA's concept is, as I said, to be close to the ownership of African states, governments, and friends. For Noguchi Institute, for Kemuri, for Madagascar government, we've been committed since, as you mentioned, long, long time ago um, to establish uh, or to support the strengthening of your own capacity, core capacity. And I'm very much proud of seeing 80% uh, of PCR testing is performed by you uh, in Ghana and perform you, you in Kenya, more than 50%. And uh, Madagascar, Madam Minister is taking her own initiative. So uh, in the name of USC and human security and health system strengthening, what we have been doing is to be close to the ownership and to support the ownership. That is a basic concept. By saying so, by saying so, uh, we learned a lot after the, this outbreak and pandemic. We have been carefully comparing 54 African countries, some of which are very much successful, some of which are not. What a difference. One of the remarkable difference is about the transparency. Transparency of decision making and transparency which produce the trust between people and the government. And by witnessing these sort of differences, we've been determined to contribute, to promote your own governance transparency and to build up the trust between you and the people. That is what JICA experienced. That is what Japan, Japan experienced. I just know very well. Japan established universal health coverage system when we were very, very much poor, a long, long, long time ago with a resource scarcity settings. So our bilateral cooperation is always learning from our own history experience and your history experience by comparing these things to be applied to Africa. That's what we are doing. And the, the second point and the last point I have to mention is we are promoting multi-actors leadership. We mm. talked a lot about the national leadership with transparency, but at the same time, we have been witnessing a lot of ownership, proactive leadership, burgeoning from private sectors and the academia, researchers, even in non-health sectors, for example, uh, near Kemuri, we have Jomo Kenyatta University. What they are doing? They are doing their best to create the equipment, medical supplies, face shield by their own efforts. The similar thing happened in Rwanda, Kigali, Fabrabu. They are producing those kind of things. In Egypt, 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 Japan, University of Science and Technology. So everybody, regardless their relationship with health, or medical activities. They are very much keen to support their own country. And JICA should be close to promote this sort of multi-actors leadership. Just one thing, one example. We are, do you know Ninja in Japanese? We are having a Ninja uh, business contest. Yes. <laughs> and uh, asking uh, more than 90 countries business sectors hmm. to yes uh, uh, clarify their own dynamic ideas to hmm. save their respective countries. And after putting these sort of proposals, we'd like to support their business sectors. So hmm. this is just one modest example, but the leadership should not only be found in the national leaders, but also in many, many 
other sectors and other layers. And in this regard, I have to tell you very frankly, Africa is the best country about this dynamics. I have to tell you very frankly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think part of this, it, there, uh, it's not just in Africa, everywhere in the world, um, we're looking at the development of vaccines or treatment, uh, therapeutic solutions to this outbreak. Um, and obviously, we have to continue to do all of the things that you've already been doing across the three countries uh, with the support of JICA. But as we think about a vaccine, one of the issues that's come out is this uh, vaccine nationalism, where um, <laughs> people who can afford it are the ones who get it. And I just wanted to hear from each of you, um, beginning with you, Madam Minister, in terms of how do you think access to vaccine should be done? And, and uh, what, from, from the perspective of, of, of African governments, uh, um, who should have access to vaccines and how will it be made available to uh, people, say, in your country? I, I would just like to hear your, your thoughts on this. Uh, thank you. Um, until now, it's, uh, it could be said that it's already difficult yet for African country to, to conduct research. We start also in Madagascar, and um, we need the financial and technological, we have the financial and technological also constraints. And uh, a continent continental cooperation is already in place to do so for a long term. For example, if we, if you, if you want to, if you have this vaccine, I think that all over the, the some partner all over the world, some found exists to make it an accessible for all the people. And uh, however, it's helpful to see the progress of treatment using traditional medicine also. But uh, for the access, I think it's not um, all the people, all the class should have access to have this, uh, this ability to access to, to, access to this, uh, this vaccine. And the country, as we said, that there is a national leadership, some fund can and can provide it to, the, to all the people. That is what, because, for example, in Madagascar, we have uh, test free for most of the people. So vaccine also, I think that it is the, uh, the leadership of our president, Andrzej Radzuelina, to see and to have in his heart that all the people in, in his country is, has the same, the same, um, the same chance to, to, to have this vaccine if it is, uh, if it it is uh, proven to, it is proven that uh, it's, it's um, how to say that, if it is proven, it can cure, I think that in his leadership now, all the people should have it and he will make it to uh, disponible, available for, uh, for all, the, all the people that need it. That is for, uh, for the, because, um, under continental cooperation and hopefully also under international solidarity. Mm -hmm. That's I said. Uh, thank, thank you, my, thank you, my minister. Um, um, Professor Combe, uh, uh, you know, uh, some American American uh, officials uh, were, were saying that you know the availability of the vaccine should be treated. Um, one of my colleagues tweeted that American officials were saying off record that the availability of the vaccines should be treated as face masks or like mask, oxygen masks in the plane. You put on your own mask and then you help the person next to you. The problem with that analogy is the mask, as my colleague noted, when the mask drop in the plane, it doesn't just drop in business class, it drops everywhere, right? So it, 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 it doesn't hold. So in terms of the availability of, of vaccine or therapeutics, when they become available, suitable, effective, safe, how, what, what are your thoughts on how, who should have access to it? 
um, it should it be constrained? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on this? Thank you very much. I think uh, what, what I can say is uh, uh, surely uh, countries actually grappling with this particular problem uh, all, uh, all over the world. And, uh, every country actually at this moment is for itself. And uh, the need for us, uh, first of all, in this African region to have a homegrown solution uh, mm -hmm. is now ever than before. Uh, the issue of uh, vaccine development at this moment is not only uh, going on in these other nations in the North, East or the West, but of course within this country, our country in Kenya, uh, this effort has already started and we have our scientists that are, are working very hard towards making this possible. But assuming that this vaccine will not uh, first be developed in our country, that it will be developed elsewhere in any other of the North, uh, East and Western countries. I think that it, 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 it is a fact that uh, everybody uh, who can actually uh, be uh, given this vaccine should be given this vaccine. Everybody should uh, actually be able to access this vaccine. And uh, one of the things that we can uh, think about uh, is should be at least a, a nationally uh, organized uh, approach in which actually funds are made available to procure these vaccines. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that uh, we, with the vaccine that has already been reported to be effective uh, to some extent, uh, it's almost all uh, sold out and uh, therefore not available for those other nations that would have wanted to actually acquire the same. But if at all this happens and the vaccine uh, is manufactured in large enough numbers, everybody should uh, actually have access to this. The, the fund I know is the biggest problem or the funding. Uh, we actually for a long time have relied uh, heavily on donor support. But uh, at this moment, as I say, that there must be homegrown solutions. The funds should be made uh, available within the the countries, including at least uh, under the universal health uh, coverage that we have been talking, including uh, national uh, health insurance uh, 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 funds that are available to make sure that this particular uh, vaccine is available to every person in the country. Thank you. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Anang, I think, um, um, uh, Professor Kim, Kim be, Combi spoke to this a bit, that uh, Rendemzivir, this uh, drug that was shown to reduce the, the impact of the disease on, on people who are sick, that all of the available doses were bought by the country, I think it was the United States, but it was not available for, even if you had the money to get it. And uh, across the continent, access to PPE, access to reagents, it's been an issue uh, in procuring the supplies that are medical supplies that Africa needs. So he spoke about the need to develop homegrown capacity to be able to do that. But I would like to hear your thoughts, um, just as I did with the minister and Professor Kombe on, on access to the vaccine when the vaccine is developed. What do you propose be the solution? And is Ghana working on a national plan if the vaccine becomes available in terms of how its citizens will get it? Thank you very much. So in Ghana, one of the, the best ways we think a vaccine developed for corona should be done is that first of all, coronavirus is a global pandemic. So it is a, a humanity shared responsibility. So even if one nation is developing a vaccine, I believe that the best thing to do is to make sure that other nations will also participate, for example, in getting the vaccine to be uh, certified for approvals, for clinical trials and things like that. So the people of Ghana should be prepared to be part of those trials. And fortunately, already the Ghana government has made some moves in that direction to indicate that Ghana is ready to participate in the development of uh, vaccines, even through uh, trials. And then the other key thing also, which was mentioned by my colleague, is that um, it is necessary to um, ensure that um, in developing a vaccine 
for it to be available. First of all, the vaccine should be available to all and for good reasons. One of the most important reasons is that uh, coronavirus belongs to a family of viruses, which is also related to the flu viruses. And we know that in today's world, we are in an age of emerging and re-emerging pathogens. So corona today may mutate and become a little different. And we know that even for flu management in terms of developing flu vaccines, there is a global collaboration to do that. Because you need to collect isolates from different countries, put them in the gene banks to be able to know that the vaccine you are developing will be effective broadly. So we need to participate collectively as nations in this process. And then, of course, the insurance is another very important thing. Uh, because we do not want, you see, if you do what happens with the oxygen mask in the plane, it will be very irresponsible for any nation to do that. Because you may have a vaccine now, you keep it to yourself or to a few nations, then a new variant of the vaccine emerges from somewhere else, then it still becomes a global pandemic then you have another problem on your hands. So honestly, I think that would be an irresponsible behavior and we should guard against it. So we should rather look for insurance schemes and systems so that even poor nations can have some way of inputting innovative financing so that those who are developing the vaccine spending large amounts of monies can at least feel the comfort of putting in those kind of efforts. So these are my reflections. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Dr. Dr. Toda, I, I wanted to come back to you on this question in terms of Japan's leadership in multilateral response, as you noted, and as other members of the panel have noted, um, the COVID-19 and a response to that is a global public good because it's a global public health issue. The entire global economy has ground to a halt. So what is Japan doing in terms of JICA, doing in terms of its leadership to ensure that when the vaccine does become available, that your partners in Africa will have access to the, to the vaccine? Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so needless to say that the vaccine should be the global public goods to be distributed to the most wanted and to the weakest, to the most fragile straighten of societies. But the reality, there are some, or I should say many sovereign countries, politicians, which are not so much obedient to this sort of textbook type should be or must be questions. <laughs> we have to be very much realistic. What we are trying so far is of course, we're doing our best in collaboration with an academia and researchers to develop as quick as possible, as quick as possible, uh, the vaccine and the medicines. We are not the main engine. We are not on the driver's seat for development, but we're supporting their activities, infrastructure mainly. Mm -hmm. By saying so, we have to be very, very much realistic about the possibility of finding proper vaccine with a pro uh, sufficient numbers. How many months or maybe years? And until then, what do we do? Our point is there. We have to be realistic. We do not deny the importance of medicine or vaccines, but we should not wait for them mm -hmm. without doing anything. The point is homegrown solutions or important solution, anyway, wisdom. By maximizing our wisdom, information, way of doing, and our available technologies to strengthen, empower our people and our system. That is what we are doing. And uh, I have to say that the JICA will drastically rethink uh, our managerial resources, uh, putting forward to health-related Health and the health related sectors in the very, very near future, and uh, uh, supporting some sort of, how do you say, omnipotential solutions in addition to 
doing our best of vaccine and medicines. Let us, let us forget about some sort of euphoristic illusion about mm -hmm. vaccines. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with you. I think uh, we have to uh, sort of look at the possibility that we may never find a vaccine. And if that never comes, then we have to adapt our lives using the public health measures we have now to be able to live as safely as we possibly can. At this point, we'd like to bring in our audience uh, and uh, some of the questions that have been coming from the audience. Those questions uh, will put uh, the questions. If the question is directly at uh, one of the panelists, we ask the question. If it is directly at the whole panel, we'll, we'll pose it to the whole question, to the whole panel. So the first question that came is, how uh, measuring using IT function to alleviate uh, the impact of COVID-19 in the three countries? Uh, how are you incorporating IT in there? For example, one of the examples they gave is. One of the ways that Taiwan has been successful is this Taiwan has uh, using the leadership of their digital minister. So in Madagascar, in Kenya, in, in Ghana, um, how are you incorporating IT into the response? A anyone can take the question. Maybe I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, in, in Kenya, uh, what actually has been uh, happening is that right from the beginning of this uh, outbreak, uh, there, there was the need actually to reduce as much as possible uh, crowding. And uh, this was crowding as, as much as it is in working places or workplaces. Uh, we actually uh, looked at uh, the institutions of higher learning, the institutions uh, that are lower, including for all the way from primary to university. And it was necessary that this crowding not to be allowed to go on because this is what would propagate the, the, the spread of this particular virus. Uh, in our workplaces also, the, the, the government actually gave guidelines. These guidelines in, in involved people actually keeping away uh, from as much as possible, unless it's very necessary, from their workplaces and working from home. Working from home also that did not mean that people should never hold it. Uh, I think I'm, I'm happy to, to actually say today that uh, never before has uh, the use of uh, IT been as, as, as uh, important and as useful uh, in the communication uh, as it has this time. We have been able to hold uh, any kind of uh, interactions uh, between work, uh, workers, between uh, institutions, and, and so on and so forth, uh, at least using virtual uh, 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 interactions uh, as much as possible. So we actually have developed a lot more in this direction, and I think and I hope this should be the thing of the future. That is, we don't necessarily have to always out uh, in meetings, uh, in the institutions, and uh, this this includes actually learning also. Uh, the, most of the classes that have been going on in uh, institutions has, have been through virtual. Uh, uh, so this is what actually I say ideas contributed by. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Uh, for um, as your question, thank you. Uh, IT is very important. Because, for example, if it is uh, there is the data, without the data we can't uh, follow, make some monitoring of, uh, for example, some um, um, the people who contract the, the virus. But also for for the experience of Madagascar, uh, the 2,000 passenger are all um, entering in the, in, uh, in data and uh, to check the contact tracing. And now we have the, a national platform for management of COVID-19. And every day they track the, the, the people who have tests to say to them that you are positive or negative. And uh, I think that the, the IT is very important for all. It's not only for, uh, for health, for this, uh, to, to manage this uh, COVID-19, but also for, uh, for the help that the governments give uh, to the people, for vulnerable people, 
uh, the funeral household to track them and to to see where are those those uh, households and how they so uh, uh, during i don't know in, in other country but now uh, i think that it is the same but now um, it makes very important the it system for all, all, all things that we, we the response or uh, the response of uh, COVID-19. Also, we have IT also to do our work. Now, we, without IT system, we can't we can't do uh, this webinar, for example. That and that makes that we can we can um, improve uh, for uh, indeed in African country the the using of uh, IT system. To manage some crisis, uh, this pandemic also, and it is very important in this uh, uh, in, to manage this uh, this COVID-19. Thank you, Madam Minister. Dr. Anang. Yes, thank you very much. So in Ghana, uh, one thing that has happened is that there has been interministerial uh, participation. So even though we have a Ministry of Health and a Ghana Health Service. The communication about COVID-19 is done by the Ministry of Information. And the country has noted that the information aspect is very important, including the IT. And uh, one of the key things that have been done. Excuse me, is Dr. Anand. It's like you're you're touching a paper or, or something and it's it's uh, it's okay. All right, yes, please. Go ahead, sir. So, so one thing that has been, I'm sorry, one thing that has been happening is that um, um, the Ministry of Information working with the other stakeholders uh, have come up with a, a decision that we need to develop a very strong laboratory information uh, systems that will allow networking of laboratories okay. in terms of the information on testing and all the other data and also a, a, a coordinator, a national coordinator for laboratory network for COVID has been uh, uh, appointed. And uh, a lot is being done also to use IT in terms of uh, for monitoring of COVID, um, uh, uh, how the disease is unfolding. And so one of the key things is that we have a data platform, which is a national platform which is a, a kind of a, a GIS based. Mm. And all the data that has been collected goes into that. So everybody in Ghana and actually even outside can access that. Mm. And you can have information on how many cases do we have, how many deaths. So even if a, a new pe a, somebody dies today, it is added to it. So there's a very, you know, uh, up to date uh, information available. And another key thing too is that uh, we are also using the data uh, collected to facilitate research and potentially also to inform the, the control uh, 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 response about which communities are perhaps having more challenge in terms of uh, the spread of the infection and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have one question here, an audience question that is actually directed at Dr. Toda. And it says that uh, COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting Japan's elderly population. How can Japan with its elder care framework provide lessons to African countries who are rapidly growing elder populations too? Okay, okay. So Japan's phenomenon has been called a kind of strange or mysterious success regarding uh, safeguarding the lives of elderly people. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't been so much successful to anatomize the factor axis, but we have some important guesses. Uh, one of the most important thing is uh, very much related to modern body's activities our behavior, our sense of sanitation, level of awareness, this sort of, how do you say, in my sense, a soft infrastructure of health system is very, very, very traditionally and historically strong in Japan, which is still active. 
And the second reason is a little bit of a technical one. We have a total separate line of public uh, health matters and the medical treatment front lines. And uh, we have also very much meticulous uh, maneuver of uh, saving elderly people. Uh, this is not a kind of a textbook type theory. It's a practice. It's a practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I cannot say in a word, but this is a kind of a Kaizen in the hospitals or something like that. That is, uh, how to say, deeply genetically implanted in the, on the soil of Japan. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I do think this sort of tacit knowledge or how to say know-how should be he found on the soil of Africa as well. For example, in terms of Kaizen Hospital uh, mm -hmm. in Uganda, they are very much active. And uh, all over the world, more than 2,000 hospitals outside Japan is practicing. Th mm -hmm. This kind of uh, uh, secret has been, uh, how to say, shareable on the ICT era very quickly. Madame Voiry's uh, washing hand movement is now seen through the YouTube. Four minutes excellent washing hand song can be seen all over the world. And the Noguchi Institute and the Kemuri is very active and fruitful and pragmatic know-how, very quickly shared with the neighboring countries. They have done marvelous by utilizing ICT. This kind of thing, uh, uh, Japan is not kind of, uh, how to say, ICT advanced country, I have to be honest, but in terms of safeguarding like the lives of people, the lives of weakest, including elderly people, our soft infrastructure is still active. And this must be the kind of origin of our knowledge co-creation, new type international cooperation. Thank you, thank you. So we, uh, we have three minutes left for our event today. So I wanted to give each of you 30 seconds for parting words, I would like to begin with uh, Madam Minister. Uh, any final words, uh, 30 seconds? <laughs> Is uh, Madam Minister there? So All right, we'll my, go to my oh, last. Uh, yes. Um, yes, Madam Minister. There is. This is for the last question, I think. This is this is just any parting words because we we end in two minutes. So any parting words, any last words? Yes, I want to share that um, in terms of uh, for the international community because I want to make advocated for for, sure. for Japan, go, go, but for. Go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of financial preparedness and uh, resilience capacity to be able to face waiver, health, or, and so economic crisis, uh, it is indeed critical and uh, a must to ensure the av availability of sustainable infrastructure, as uh, Professor Toda said, uh, infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure based on human security, focused approach to preserve freedom from and uh, freedom from will of our population. But you need to not un underestimate also nutrition. I believe that the international community would need to push further and uh, on the agenda of uh, uni in universal health coverage and in the same vein as uh, and has been proven from the actual COVID uh, crisis experiences, the pressing needs to ensure access to all for drinking water and sanitation. With its actual yet low rates to access for drinking water and sanitation, tremendous challenges remains, remain for Madagascar. Our government demonstrated its commitment to address this matter 
by creating a separated department for water, sanitation, and hygiene. So I would like to take this opportunity to call upon the international community to work hand in hand for more investments destined to support the African own effort on health and wash sector. That, that's all my last uh, uh, say for this uh, joint. Thank you, Madam Minister, and we will let and we will let the minister's words be the last one. Um, Professor Kombe, Dr. Anang, Dr. Tola, Minister, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. For our audience, we appreciate your participation and your being here at the Center for Global Development. We'll continue to produce the content that is important and do our vigorous research to improve human lives and and the ability of humans to thrive and prosper, prosper where they are. So again, thank you to everybody and uh, you have a great day.